You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It was the daffiest get-rich scheme since the South Sea bubble. So wrote Caleb Williams in his book, From the Crash to the Blitz, the 1930s. And it was the send-a-dime chain letter fad. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Denver, 1935, New York Times. Send a dime chain letters are pouring into the post office here in a new scheme which has sprung up almost overnight. Postal helper Roy E. Nelson said the scheme was a violation of the lottery laws prohibiting the use of the mails for fraud and threatens to arrest the organizers of the scheme if they can be found. The send a dime letters would say something like this. Hope, faith, charity. This chain was started in the hope of bringing you prosperity. Within three days, make five copies of the letter, leaving off the top name on this letter and address and adding your own name and address at the bottom and mail it to five of your friends to whom you wish prosperity to come. In omitting the top name, send that person 10 cents as a charity donation. In turn, when your name reaches the top of the list, you will receive 15,625 letters. Have the faith your friends had, and this chain will not be broken. And it just simply worked like this. You got a letter with names on it, addresses too. You were urged to send a dime to the person at the top, scratch the name, add your own at the bottom, and send copies of the letters to five friends. And if no one broke that chain, you'd get 1500 bucks from a dime. Even if it was preposterous, maybe, maybe it would just work. Beginning in March 1935, it turned into a national mania. It clogged up the mails, disrupted offices. Everyone was talking about the send-a-dime letters. Within 24 hours of the first known letter, there were postal delays across the country. Denver's post office added 90 clerks in order to handle the mail. Des Moines, Iowa banks ran out of money and had to seek out Chicago banks for the dimes. Chain letters reached Dallas by April 30th, and St. Louis, Missouri on May 8th. In St. Louis, the chain letter doubled the normal volume of mail, from 450,000 to 800,000 letters. And quickly, they experienced the same shutdowns that Denver had experienced days before. A poor seamstress is reported to have received enough to purchase a new sewing machine, A mother is said to have paid off hospital expenses for having her baby. A widow paid for a husband's funeral. None of these, the New York Times said, have been confirmed. Almost every family in the city of Denver has received more than one of these letters. Now, most copies of the Send the Dime that are still around contain an instruction to wrap the dime in paper. As one chain letter expert says, a loose coin can work through the edge of an envelope with the jostling of transport or be slung out deliberately. Wrapping it in paper prevents this. Many of these send-a-dime letters up the ante and said, send 25 cents or send a dollar or even more. 10 cents in 1935 was worth about $1.75. Denver, April 27th. Letters from foreign countries appeared today in the send-a-dime mail avalanche. This fad is spreading like hysteria to all parts of the country and to foreign countries, the postmaster of Denver said. If it isn't stopped, other cities will face the same crisis as Denver, a breakdown in service. No one got hurt very badly, nor did anyone make a killing. But millions of people worked up such a lather of expectancy over it that the national sanity seemed to become unstuck. No part of the country was immune. Several hundred letters went to Franklin Roosevelt. Several went to Al Smith. Gangsters, basketball players, and bishops were among the people who received these send-a-dime letters. 
a newspaper advertisement appealing to his friends not to send me any more chain letters was inserted today by A. A. McVitie, a Denver restaurant man. I have so far received 2,300 of the send a dime and send 10 bucks letters, McVitie said. I can't answer them, and they are delaying my legitimate business correspondence. Please, friends, don't send me any more. From the New York Times, an endless letter chain is a form of geometrical progression. Such a progression is a series of which each term after the first is derived from the preceding one by multiplying a constant number. Thus, if the calculator starts with 3 and keeps multiplying by 3, he gets the series 3, 9, 27, 81, etc. He can do this indefinitely or stop after a certain number of operations. The Denver scheme, which already has been declared illegal by the post office, is typical. The progression augmented by multiples of 5 will run if the chain is not broken like this, 5, 25, 125, 625, 3,125, 15,625. An unearned pyramided increment of 1,562. This from May 1935, New York Times. Send to dime letters received in New York. Chain please reaching here are like those in the West. Inquiry underway. The send a dime chain letter scheme, which flooded the Denver post office with mail last month, has reached New York. It was learned yesterday. The letters have been received by many persons here, and 70 in one big advertising agency are known to have done their bit to keep the chain going by sending out dimes and writing additional letters. At the general post office, it was said that four or five letters had been turned over to the post office inspectors for investigation, including one which raised the ante from a dime to a dollar, and the theoretical prize, if the chain is unbroken, to $15,000. The post office inspectors are investigating under a ruling issued at Washington last week that the scheme is illegal under the postal lottery and fraud statutes, although it has been admitted that it is difficult to stop it without getting a search warrant to open every letter mailed and discovered whether it is part of the chain. It has been pointed out that the chain is always broken. Although some persons may get more than their dimes back, others may get nothing. Despite campaigns of repression conducted by the post office department, the realm of the chain letter is still extensive, although not as far-reaching as it used to be. The chief weapon used against the commercial chain operators is a postal regulation which reads, Endless chain enterprises designed for the sale of or disposition of merchandise or other things of value through the circulation or distribution of coupons, tickets, certificates, introductions, and the like are held to embrace the elements of a lottery and also to be fraudulent. Matter of any kind, relating to such enterprises, should be withdrawn from the mails. Time magazine found that racketeers had picked up on the craze, mailing some 30,000 letters with their own name on it. It got even to the point that those things would be propagated in and of themselves. In other words, people would say, join our pot of gold club, where we're going to make letters for the same club and share the profits. Springfield, Missouri was particularly hit by this craze. This is the 1930s. Depression is is on. A lot of empty storefronts in the downtown. Some of these storefronts were converted to offices where there would be notarized letters. And they said, our letters are different. They're a dollar. And the signatures are all notarized. So give a dollar for our letters, scratch off the name, send a dollar to the top of the list. Now, notarizing signatures or not didn't make any difference in how the thing was going to get. What happened to these Sunday dime letters? Well, nobody quite knows. Um, diminishing returns killed it off is what Caleb Williams suggests, that eventually people weren't sending them as much or believing in them as much, and the whole thing wouldn't work anymore. Once the chain is broken, it decelerates pretty quickly as fast as it accelerates. But really the idea of this chain letter concept, and people who, you know, are kind of in the days where more you know, or from the times when more mail was sent, know about chain letters, chain faxes, chain emails, and the like. And they have a long history. I mean, in the, the, the send a dime letters come from the good luck letters of the 1920s. Here's an article from the Modesto Evening News of 1922. 
chain letters. They're asinine affairs that should not be tolerated by men and women who like good mail service. The chain letter that is now going the rounds in Modesto starts off with a list of 20 or more names of people who have already passed it on to nine of their friends. Following the names is this asinine request. And the letter said this. Good luck. Copy this and send it to nine friends whom you wish good luck. The chain started by an American officer should go three times around the world. Do not break the chain, for whoever does will have bad luck. Do it within 24 hours and count nine days, and you will have some great good fortune. So you see all the elements right in that short little bit there of what a chain letter or viral message is, right? There's some hint at credibility from an American officer. What does that mean? And there's also some positive and negative reinforcement. The positive is you're going to get good fortune. The negative is you're going to have bad luck. But what's really doing is destroying the mail service. Uh, from a chain letter website, in 1900, shorter secular letters appeared in the U.S. that promised good luck if copies were distributed and bad luck if not. Billions of these luck chain letters circulated in the next 100 years. As they replicated through the decades, some accumulated copying errors, offhand comments, and calculated innovations that helped them prevail in the competition with others. For example, complimentary testimonials developed, one exploiting perceived good luck, another exploiting perceived bad luck. Sometimes there would be errors. For instance, uh, the letter started out saying this charm was started in the hopes of bringing prosperity to you, and it was changed to this chain was started in the hope of bringing prosperity to you. This introduces the term chain letter. But it also enhances the fact that you can't break this chain. You need the chain for it to succeed to get the prosperity. Um, writers sometimes added their own text. For instance, a few versions of the letter included, If you are unwilling to carry this work on, please return this letter to the last mentioned on the list. So the chain won't be broken. Sort of like making you feel guilty. In the 1970s, a luck chain letter from South America that touted a lottery winner invaded the U.S. and was combined on one page with an indigenous chain letter. This combination rapidly dominated circulation. A postscript concluding, it works, was added to one of these combination letters, and within a few years, the progeny of this single letter had replaced all the millions of similar letters in circulation without a simple postscript, it works. Tens and millions of the Send a Dime Prosperity Club chain letter spread throughout the United States. Nobody's quite certain who created that first letter. Federal authorities sought the author for prosecution, but were not successful. It's possible it started in Denver. The Denver Liberty newspaper in 1935 said the author was a woman. She had received a similar chain letter and supposed that with a few minor changes, she could cause the letter to more easily propagate. Early versions of the letter included women's names only. The send a dime ebbed throughout the spring of 1935, really into the whole year and into 1936. By May of 35, the New York Times was reporting that their fad was a little on the wane. I mean, hopes of becoming rich from the scheme began to fade. And parodies in the newspapers and prominent people making fun of it gave the scheme an aura of ignorance. Now, What's important? What's the reason for even talking about this? Well, just substitute a dime for a political idea, right? And you can see the elements of something spreading virally without even needing the technology. There's so much talk about social media uh, these days, and certainly social media is excellent. It's, it's very design is to spread things much in the way that a chain letter would in the past. But, um, I think it's like all things in history. If you know the history of something, you know that it's not new. Therefore, the solutions may not have to be new. So think about it this way. So these, um, so the desire of someone to spread a message that otherwise, you know, just on its surface might seem like a scam or untrue, with just a limited note of some credibility and this pressure to do it, or else, you know, you're not you doing your duty. You're not. Uh, you're, you're breaking the chain, etc., you know, it's pretty strong. These are not always good 
For example, you have the 1986 um, letters that accused Procter and Gamble of Satanism. And it says this, the president of Procter and Gamble recently appeared on the Phil Donahue TV show, and the subject of which he spoke was his company's support of the Church of Satan. Okay, so Phil Donahue, a recognized figure, at least at the time, so you're establishing some fake credibility. Christians should always remember that if they buy any products with this symbol, they are unknowingly supporting the Church of Satan and devil worship. Please feel free to make copies of this and put them out anywhere where you feel people should be informed. That little notice is something common in chain letters. Targeted distribution. Any preference or exclusion in the selection of ex recipients. You know, chain letters usually have something to say like, send these to your friends. Which may seem of little help in circulation, but it at least discourages sending to, say, a sublist celebrity who isn't going to spread it on to anyone. And if it can be done with dimes, then it can be done with political ideas as well. And it's something to think about. You could do many things in 19th century politics, but you didn't mess with the Grand Army of the Republic. That was until a president did it in 1887. The Grand Army of the Republic was a Union veterans organization, an exclusively one, meaning you had to be a soldier on the Union side in the Civil War to join the GAR. It was founded in 1866, but got its strength when its commander-in-chief of the veterans organization, John Logan, who later become a U.S. senator, declared May 30th, 1868 to be Memorial Day and to be observed annually. The graves of those who had fallen in the Civil War would be decorated with flowers and observances. It didn't take long for there to be posts in every state in the United States and some posts overseas. But it was more than just an organization to help promote veterans. It grew into a political force. And in fact, peak membership was 400,000 in 1890. Not only did it help get presidents elected, presidents were members of the GAR. Ulysses S. Grant was a member of the Philadelphia Post handed, headed up by General George G. Meade. Rutherford B. Hayes was a member of the Fremont, Ohio Post. Benjamin Harrison, member of the Indianapolis Post. William McKinley, member of the Canton, Ohio Post. James J. Garfield, we believe, based on publications in GAR, that he was a member of some post. Its mission was defense of the late soldiery of the United States morally, socially, and politically. That became a problem when the nation elected its first Democrat after the Civil War, who was not a member of of the GAR, and hadn't served in the war, Grover Cleveland. But the GAR, powerful as it was, would also meet a pretty powerful political force in that president. The situation called for a light touch, but... That was not Grover Cleveland's style. Grover Cleveland, hired in part as president for his stance on civil service reform that made him amenable to independent-minded Republicans as well as Democrats, to get them to support a person of the opposite party. He issued more vetoes than any president before. Actually, at 414 vetoes in his first term, Grover Cleveland issued more than double all the presidents before him. Including Ulysses S. Grant, who there was a big deal of when he made 93 vetoes. Many of Grover Cleveland's vetoes, however, were more of individual pension applications which in the 1880s had to be sent to Congress at an individual level. That means one soldier applying for a pension would apply to Congress, and it would be voted on as a bill. 
Congress was supporting a lot of them, many for perhaps unjustified, unearned applications. While he insisted that he was not against Union soldiers, indeed, he wished, he said, to restore honor to the pension system of the United States, to continue it as a role of honor for the Republic. He constantly ran up against the Grand Army of the Republic, the Organization of Union Veterans. Grover Cleveland was not their favorite president, first Democratic president, support of the former Confederate states in his election, and Cleveland had not served. He paid a Polish immigrant to serve in his place, which one could do at that time. He did support the war through his funding, but not through his personal service. To the Grand Army of Republic, the president was a shirker. Cleveland and the Grand Army of Republic battled over the Blair Bill. The Blair Bill for pensions called for any veteran who served up to 90 days to receive a pension of $12 a month when they hit the appropriate age. Cleveland vetoed it, calling it a roll of fraud. Samuel Tilden once mockingly said about Grover Cleveland, he has so much backbone, it makes him stick out in front. And Edward Bragg once said at the Democratic National Convention that nominated him, Cleveland became loved in New York, not just for his character, but also for the enemies he had made. But with the Grand Army of Republic, he certainly made an enemy. The head official of the U.S. Army had a recommendation. The U.S. should return captured Confederate battle flags that were stored in the War Department. This enraged the G.A.R. when they heard about it. Lucius Fairchild, the national commander of the G.A.R., said, May God palsy the hand that wrote that order. May God palsy the brain that conceived it, and may God palsy the tongue that dictated it. Now, it really was just an order. The flags had not been returned yet at this point. But nonetheless, the GR is going to denounce Cleveland as a viper, a traitor, a hater of Union veterans. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Hutchinson, Minnesota had some problems. For the adults of Hutchinson, the problem was the teenagers. They kept sneaking off at night to empty barns where they'd brace yourself, dance. Who knew what sort of sin and heavy petting and French literature these barn dances might lead to? No, the adults of Hutchinson, Minnesota did not approve. And neither, it seemed, did the devil. One summer night, Satan himself suddenly appeared in the middle of the dance floor, and the debauched teens ran in fear. He showed up at the next dance, too. For a few months, it seemed like you couldn't go to a late-night barn dance in Hutchinson without getting chased out by the devil, pitchfork in tow. Until one night, when a 14-year-old boy had the good sense to shoot him in the chest. At which point, the devil was revealed, Scooby-Doo style but bloodier, to be the local Methodist minister, dressed in a costume and flown in from the roof by rope and pulley. This is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the accidents, mistakes, and bad ideas that helped misshape our world. Find us at ConstantPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. From Alan Nevin's Grover Cleveland, A Study in Courage. In April 1887, it occurred to Adjutant General Richard C. Drum that the Union and Confederate flags stored in the basement and attic of the War Department and rapidly falling into dust were a nuisance. 
survivors of Union regiments had sometimes applied for the return of their colors and had always gotten them. Drum was a Republican and a member of the GAR. He suggested to the Cleveland administration that it would be a graceful act to anticipate such requests by transmitting all the flags, both Union and Confederate, to the various states. The president verbally assented, and his Secretary of War returned the Adjutant General's memorandum with the endorsement, the within recommendation approved by the president. The actual response, once the order was published, was a stunning surprise. It is important to discriminate between a great body of sincere protests, intended merely to induce Cleveland to retrace his step, and a body of purely malicious and partisan protests, intended to discredit the president. Governor Martin of Kansas wired the president that the act was an insult to the heroic dead and an outrage on their surviving comrades. Senator Manderson of Nebraska sent Cleveland a long letter citing Vattel, Halleck's international law, and other authorities in opposition to a return of captured flags. While Senator Hawley of Connecticut wrote the president that he was deeply saddened and that flags taken from our misguided brothers and wicked conspirators should be burnt. Manderson had led an Ohio regiment at Shiloh, and Hawley had fought gallantly as a brigadier before Richmond. These men spoke from the heart, These objectors were respectful. Worst of all was the conduct of Governor J.B. Foraker of Ohio, not content with telegraphing Cleveland that the patriotic people of his state are shocked and indignant beyond anything I can express. He wrote an inflammatory letter declaring that no rebel flags will be surrendered while I am governor, which he circulated broadcast. And when Cleveland revoked the order, he spoke of the president as having sneaked like a whipped spaniel. And all of this leads up to the meeting in St. Louis, the Grand Army of the Republic encampment. Now, this is a issue that was probably headed to Cleveland one way or the other. Every president since Cleveland had attended the Grand Army of Republic encampment. It's a big event that they hold each year. But every president since Cleveland had also enjoyed the support of the Grand Army of the Republic, which Cleveland did not. In 1887, as we get up to the St. Louis meeting, the local Grand Army posts are passing resolutions. It's not just individual members saying. It's posts that are passing resolutions of their members, condemning the president as a traitor, as a Cataline. A post in Iowa goes so far as to instruct its committee to write resolutions in burning letters of red on blood-red paper, to enclose them in a blood-red envelope and tie with crimson-stained ribbon to demonstrate the penalty of treason is death. Well, Cleveland has a dilemma. Now, is he going to go to St. Louis, probably be harassed, shouted at, perhaps even threatened? You know, security for presidents wasn't that tight. But if he doesn't go, is he going to get called a coward? Cleveland was not a man to hesitate. Mayor Francis, at the time of the battle flag order, was in the East. Francis is the mayor of St. Louis. Cleveland, hastily calling him to Washington, sent him back to St. Louis to sound popular sentiment. The mayor's report was clear. The resident members of the GAR, whom I have met, disclaim any feeling of antipathy to you and profess a desire to have you to attend the encampment. They express at the same time, however, a fear lest your presence will deter many posts from coming. I find a growing sentiment among the local GAR to have you decline the invitation to the encampment and to enable you to do so gracefully that... They are asking me to originate a movement inviting you to attend our annual fair pageant, which will be held the week after the encampment. Most of his advisors say, look, uh, President Cleveland, just wait for this to blow over and then make a statement. Cleveland chooses not to. He goes early on and he attacks the Grand Army of the Republic, put them on the defensive. He writes a letter to David Francis. And, of course, he writes this and also makes it public. In the letter, he declares that personal threats did not concern him. But he was shocked by the fact that scores of men in the Grand Army of the Republic were threatening the dignity of the presidential office. This was unpatriotic. 
And he, Cleveland, was duty-bound to protect the virtue of his office by skirting a confrontation with the Grand Army of the Republic. The threat of personal violence and harm, in case I undertake this trip in question, which scores of misguided, unbalanced men under the stimulation of excited feeling I've made, are not even considered, but I should bear with me there, the people's highest office, the dignity which I must protect. So in other words, I'm not afraid. I can go there and have this kind of like um, harassing, haranguing, meeting, shouting at people, having people shout at me, but I am the owner of the presidential office and all the dignity that comes with it, and I can't submit to that. And then Cleveland takes two steps. He changes his itinerary, having written this message, to avoid going to the encampment. And then, relying on a technicality, he says, actually, the return of the Confederate battle flags, that has to be decided by Congress. So he kicks it to them. Here's what uh, Alan Evans says. The letter through the GAR upon the defense of its offices had never repudiated the outrageous utterances of such members as Fairchild and were left in an unhappy position. Scores of editorials denounced them. When Cleveland attended the Clinton Centennial in July, he devoted his brief evening speech before his old neighbors to the subject of the dignity of the presidential office. Moreover, he showed unusual adroitness in heightening the popular impression that the Grand Army of the Republic was in the wrong. When the letter to Mayor Francis was published, 150 veterans of Lynn, Massachusetts, had just arrived in Washington from a tour of the Virginia battlefields. A newspaper quoted one of them saying as they would not call upon the president. We can see enough rebels south, he said. The indignant post thereupon obtained permission to wait upon Cleveland, marched into the East Room, and cheered him vigorously. I want you to understand, said Cleveland, that I have lost no confidence in the GAR as an organization. It is incomprehensible to me that men who have risked their lives to save the government should return home to abate one jot or title of respect and support which every good citizen owes to the constituted authorities. He shook them all, he took them all by the hand, and forming anew in the front of the White House, they gave him and Mrs. Cleveland the marching salute as he went for his afternoon drive. This according to the New York Herald. He also drove home his attack on the intolerant element among the veterans by a letter to a Pennsylvania Post which had asked for a donation, and got it. This is what Cleveland writes. No one can deny that the Grand Army of the Republic had been played upon by demagogues for partisan purposes, and has yielded to insidious blandishments, to such an extent that it can be regarded by many as an organization which has wandered a long way from its original design. Such a sentiment not only exists, but will grow and spread unless within that organization something is done to prove that his objects are not partisan, unjust, and selfish. Though it was bad enough to have a president abused in terms worse than any used since Andrew Johnson's time, it was worse to hear section taunting section again. The North listened to excited talk about rebels and slave drivers, and the South to angry denunciation of tyrants and robbers. While the Tribune spoke of the battle flags, as mementos of a foul a crime as any in human history. The New Orleans state said that it looked forward to the day when some foreign war will compel the cowardly rascallions of the Republican Party to recognize that the South will do far more than they to protect the flag about which they are always croaking. Well, a lot of people argue that that was the case, right? Um, that uh, certainly, starting with the Spanish American in World War II, you had North and South fighting together and That was always the goal. So um, a little bit there about Grover Cleveland facing a lot of abuse in a situation over battle flags over the Civil War and its memory just 20 years after events. And um, also about his real stand all behind this is a real stand against pensions, which he didn't want to enlarge. He's going to be out of office. Um, there will be some attacks in the 1988 election, in the 1888 election, you know, equating democracy, the Democratic Party, with the Confederacy and the like. And um, this issue will be raised. Benjamin Harrison will institute 
a big expansion in Civil War pensions, almost making it for northern males almost a form of social security in the 19th century. Despite all this and gaining some public standing from the dispute, Union veterans were not a good demo for Cleveland. And you know, Cleveland loses in 1888 in a very narrow result. Hinging on the state of New York, it's very possible that the loss of such support from the GAR hurt his chances of getting a second term without, you know, waiting a term to do it. He'd return in 1893, but he'd never quite be popular with veterans. And his policies on hard money in a party of Democrats that were facing an economic disaster in the 1890s when he comes back and were not popular generally with his party made him an outlier who was also the president of their party, which was always a strange situation. Just one example of it is Alabama Senator John T. Morgan, a Democrat just like Cleveland, who summarized the opinions of many by saying, I hate the ground that man walks on. And that's within his own party. In 2007, a track hoe that was completing work for a new parking garage for a hotel in Cincinnati got stuck in the ground that it was digging, partially flipped over as the ground started sinking. It had to be pulled out. The construction crew was completely surprised by it, but historians weren't. Historians knew that underneath that ground was a tunnel originally constructed as part of a subway system for Cincinnati, a system that few people knew about, at least one government agency had said to forget about, and the citizens of Cincinnati largely had. Hidden under streets with large manholes visible only in certain areas that people knew about with these large steel gates locked up, not thought about much by the city's public officials, sometimes full of graffiti, certainly spider webs, and certainly dust, and really forbidden to be trespassed on, though these rules were sometimes defied. Some of its tunnels were filled with bricks. Its entire elevated line, the line above ground, was removed in the 1960s. And few are alive who even remember the history of it firsthand. But at one point, all of Cincinnati supported it. And perhaps it could have transformed the city. As it is, Cincinnati, Ohio, remains an automobile city. With Uber, with Lyft, and for public transportation, largely buses. They're good buses, from what I am led to believe by people who live there. Some hybrid buses. Good service, if sometimes late, as you might find in any city. On an average day, on an average day, 55,000 trips in Cincinnati are made on public buses. But the metropolitan region of Cincinnati has over 2 million people. That means it ranks 46 out of 50 in terms of bus ridership. And ridership has even fallen, and the city is looking at downsizing to smaller buses. It's been estimated from a 2014 study that Cincinnatians spent an additional 60 hours behind the wheel because of the traffic congestion there. Cincinnati has a long history. It was America's real first big western city. It's the queen city of the west. Its name has George Washington in it. The Cincinnati, story of the famous Roman general who led the nation and then went back to his farm in peace. Its position on the Ohio River on the way to Mississippi was a godsend in the early going of the country. In 1850, Cincinnati had surpassed Boston and Philadelphia in terms of its population and was growing much faster. But then the issues came. One is that as it grew, Cincinnati is a city essentially boxed in by hills to the east, to the west, and to the north. The south is the Ohio River, 
around the city in a ring is floodplains. And and in early times, parts of this area was dug into canals. That limits its growth. Other cities could just expand. For Cincinnati, there were hills to contend with. And there was no flood-free area to grow in. That and the Erie Canal in New York, competition from railroads, growth cities like Cleveland and Chicago, factories being built in places like St. Louis, where it was just easier to find factory land and expand, and immigrants following where those industrialists and factories went. Those cities would see the growth. But as you get to the 19-teens, mass transit's a big deal. New York, Boston already built their subways. And by April 1916, Cincinnati's looking to join. The leadership in the city proposes a $6 million bond issue for the construction of a project that would become the Rapid Transit Loop. 16 miles of subway tunnels encircling the city, using ravines, canals, hillsides that were unpopulated, cutting in digging great tunnels, enclosing them. You see this in an article published in the Cincinnati Commercial Tribune. This is the final words of the Citizen Rapid Transit Loop Committee. We believe that the city we love, our home, is at the turning point. And that with the coming of rapid transit, we have the beginning of a greater, more prosperous, healthier, and happier Cincinnati. We believe that a vote for the loop is a vote for the best interest of all of us. And it is with pride that we state that every newspaper in the city is for the loop and practically all of the business organizations, as well as the trade unions. Old Cincinnati can't. New Cincinnati says, I will. It was a powerful message and it worked. Citizens voted for this and it had the support of the political leadership, which was a powerful one. And we'll get into that. If you drive through this intersection, you might not think anything of it, but underneath it actually lies a fully built subway station. The only thing left that you can see from the surface is the suspiciously large metal grate. We're going to look around and see if there's any other surface signs that the subway still exists. But yet, in 2021, the Cincinnati subway exists only in the mind of some. It's only known by some. We are in the subway. (laughs) Uh, I happened upon it in reading an interesting book about the subject as I began to study more local history. You know, a project I, I looked in, you know, embarked on a couple of years ago is just to get some more local history books and to tell the story of American history through the viewpoints of some of what was going on in local areas. This story intrigued me a lot because it is a story of politics. And it's kind of funny because it's intra-Republican politics. At the time we're talking, the 20th century, Cincinnati was a Republican city, but there were two distinct groups, and we'll get into that. But today, the only thing you see is a few websites that have pictures of these kind of ruined subways. A few people know about it. A few people sneak in. Where's the station? Um, Do you think it still exists behind this wall, or they filled it in? I think it still exists behind this wall, and they just filled it in. I mean, they just put the wall Okay, so that means that the next station is going with the fallout shelter, and then the one after that will be the final station that has the platform in the middle. And go down there. Certainly, graffiti artists had found the subways over the years. So there was a time, while this was abandoned, that this place was still stocked with food and everything. Obviously, none of that's here anymore. What happened? Work began in the beginning of the 1920s. Several stations were created. Several tunnels were dug. There were some infrastructure issues. Houses along the plan route began to crumble. Some foundations were cracking and porches of people's houses were falling off and they started suing the city. Also, prohibition went into effect, which closed many of the city's breweries and taverns. And Because the city got its revenue from those taxes on alcohol sales. As we're going to discuss, there was a time when a number of the, a majority of the Cincinnati or city council were bartenders and bar owners. They had also underestimated the cost when they did the initial bonds, and there wasn't political energy to get new bonds. Bond money ran out, and in 1927, only seven miles of tunnels had been completed. 
At the same time, the automobile was becoming popular in the 1920s, and Central Parkway in Cincinnati is built, and it opens up to great fanfare. Who cares about this kind of subway project that's taking too long? But really, it's about politics. Cincinnati's politics were run, essentially, by George Cox, also known as Boss Cox. He was a saloon owner and, and voted Republican. And because the city was then under Democratic control, we're talking about the 1870s, he found that his saloon was getting harassed by the police. So in 1879, he runs for city council. That was the way he could keep his saloon immune from attack. While he didn't originally want to become a boss, he was so successful as a political organizer that he did. He set up shop in his own Mecca saloon, and that became the mini city hall. If people wanted a job in the city, they came to the Mecca saloon. If they wanted a dispute resolved, they came there. He manages James Blaine's presidential campaign in Cincinnati, sets up the Young Men's Blaine Club, That club became his base of political operations from which eventually he would take over the city. It wasn't just Blaine, though. It started when he owned the Mecca Saloon. As important as he was to the politics of winning Ohio in presidential elections, he got some criticism from other Republicans. Lincoln Stevens called Cincinnati the second worst run city in the country. Was Cox would would brag about keeping taxes low, but city services also suffered. It was estimated that George Cox, in his um, heyday, controlled as many as 5,000 city jobs. Street cleaners, police officers, teachers, janitors, bailiffs, clerks, even federal jobs, because he had influence over Ohio Senator Joseph Foraker, who he helped support. Each appointment was ultimately approved by the man that was called the Old Boy. William Taft makes a speech in 1905 saying, He's not president at this time. The government under the machine is constantly described as a very corrupt one. Cincinnati will vote for Woodrow Wilson in the 1912 election. Well, a couple things are going to contribute to um, Cox's uh, loosening of the power. Um, There were always attempts. There was a Union Labor Party in 1887 that tried to take control, independent Democratic coalition in 1894. But a couple of things will happen. One is that Cox keeps supporting annexations of other areas of greater Cincinnati into the city hub, but these voters aren't necessarily going to be aligned with him. That 1912 election hurts him because a Democrat is able to get in as the mayor of Cincinnati, and it's an independent-minded one who will shut down some of his gambling operations. But it's really going to be the progressive movement. Uh, He starts to get into legal trouble, too. There's an indictment on a perjury charge in 1911, 1913, charges of mishandling funds for a bank that he owned. In 1915, he has a stroke, and he announces that he's leaving politics. He dies in 1916 at the age of 63. This is right as the progressive movement is in full swing, and that effort in Cincinnati is led by Murray Seasongood, a lawyer, Harvard-trained, starts taking on his political machine. Now, in what Murray Seasongood does, and he's got support from the current president, Warren Harding, who says he'd like to see the Cox machine, which is now under Rudolf Heineke, who actually runs, uh, this is interesting, he actually runs the uh, political machine in Cincinnati from New York. Seasongood wins an election to city manager, He starts putting in uh, reforms, and the rapid transit loop, the subway, becomes a political symbol of the Cox machine and suffers because of it. The newspapers say that it's slow going, that it's a botch, trains are too big for the tunnels, curves were too sharp, um, which wasn't really true, but reported in the papers. Season Good founds a city charter committee, and tries to change the mechanism of electing a government in Cincinnati in order to gain power. It's successful in 1924. The city council goes from 32 members, handpicked by the Cox machine and the Heineke machine, to nine, with nonpartisan elections. Civil service system to eliminate political patronage, and Cincinnati becomes the first large city with a council and manager administration, where an elected manager runs the town. Season Good then becomes on the council, 
and the members of the council elect him as the first mayor under this new system. These systems, the city manager systems, and I'm aware of them in other states as well for various localities, are very good when you're trying to reform things. They're not incredibly democratic because, you know, you're picking a mayor among the council people. It's very good for when you've got to kind of tidy things up and you don't need uh, the whims of um, democratic political machines affecting that. And that's what they did. Uh, unfortunately, the subway becomes a victim of it. Here's what one article says. Um, Season Good and the Charter Rights, those supporting the charter system for Cincinnati, did not just attack the administration of the project by the machine-owned Rapid Transit Commission, but they also spread information, misinformation regarding the subway's physical character and inserted doubt about the line's utility into the public consciousness. Upon taking the mayor's seat in January 1926, Season Good picked a fight with the Rapid Transit Commission and shifted public interest away from the Rapid Transit Loop. And he shifted it over to proposals for short streetcar subways in the downtown area. But he wasn't leading any effort to build any of these tunnels. It was just a way to distract from the main transit loop that would really connect the city. Um, even Season Good, it appears, didn't want to kill the subway project, but certainly to delay it until there could be more controls. After World War II, the rapid transit loop right away was in the way of Interstate 75 and its plans. And so politicians a generation removed from any of the subway ideas just allowed to allow the subway, a, a crucial subway tunnel to be cut off by I-75. So um, the bonds that are initiated in 1916 um, – are totally spent by 1926. They're not paid off until 1966. In 2002, Cincinnati's voters had a chance to resurrect the incomplete subway and to transform it. The Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority proposed a ballot referendum called Metro Moves, which would have created a light rail system, and it would have incorporated the three remaining subway stations that had been built as part of the project, maybe to get some value out of that long-lost project. It would include seven light rail lines and 72 stations, total cost $2.7 billion. Federal government was covering most of that, but Hamilton County, which includes Cincinnati, uh, was asked to approve a half-cent sales tax levy to cover their portion. Local businesses endorsed the plan, environmentalists liked it, good government groups. While there was a lot of promotion for Metro Moves in 2002, Hamilton County residents rejected it on a two-to-one vote, with over 68% voting against the project. It was in 1936 that after the subway had stopped being worked on, the city commissioned an engineer club of Cincinnati to produce a report. How do they use this property? The report said it can only be used for a subway. And it should be forgotten. They looked into later using it for automobile traffic, but the tunnels weren't constructed for that purpose. They could be used to put streetcar or trolleys underground, but the city had too much expenditures as it was and was designed now for the automobile. So the project faded into memory. Should Cincinnati be glad? But what's the real cost of this? When we talk about infrastructure and we can sing a sad song, about a subway that was lost. And I'm sure many people in Cincinnati do that. Perhaps that light rail idea that there could have been some usage for picking up some of that previous expenditure and work that had been done. I also think you have to consider the alternative, though. Did Cincinnati really need a subway system? And that other cities, and I'm thinking in particular about New York, in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, early 90s, found that subways were hard to patrol. It produced a lot of crime. I mean, the subway in New York City was a dangerous place in the 1970s. And it took, and this is New York, and it's a much larger city, but it took 3,100 police officers to patrol. And even then, crime was pretty high in the subways at that time. And criminals figured out the patrol patterns of the police officers, worked around it. Before graffiti-resistant metal was developed, the New York City subways were defaced with graffiti, just as the um, 
remaining tunnels in Cincinnati were. Would that have been the fate of Cincinnati to have had this expenditure just to have this uh, system that would be unattractive and perhaps unsafe for a large portion of people? I mean, how much pain, you know, you think about it and look, I mean, this is my history can beat up your politics. We're going to look at a lot of different sides here. And there's a lot of promise and benefit from mass transit, right? Being able to get from one place to another. The economic benefits of that you have to consider. Um, the ability to, you know, the New York subway system, for instance, allows you to really pinpoint where you can get in the city. Now, there's not many American cities that are quite like that. Most subway systems, whether it be... Um, Boston or LA get or, or DC, you know, get you to a point and then you have to navigate from there often extensively to get to where you're going. Uh, and that would have been the case with the Cincinnati system. You also have to look at the pain. For many, the subway caused great pain for cities, for budgets. New York City went bankrupt, not only because of running a subway, which was later taken over by the state there, but partially it contributed to it. And also the pain of those who were victims of crime on those subways or dark areas surrounding the subway station platforms and the like. Did the citizens of Cincinnati save themselves some trouble in its history by not having this infrastructure? Those remain open questions. Many people have tried to propose things. A nightclub proposed by the father of George Clooney in the 70s. Perhaps it could be used as a bomb shelter, they thought, in the 60s. There was even a proposal to store wine in it. And finally, most recently, could it be used for movie producers who needed to show a subway but couldn't afford to close down a subway in a major city. Hey, we've got a ruined subway here in Cincinnati. You can film. They proposed it to the producers of Batman. But thus far, there hasn't been a successful movie film there. I want to thank you for listening. This is an episode where we've had talked about multiple stories. You can see this year that it's one thing we're doing, trying to tell small stories that can speak to big issues in American politics. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics. And if you like the program, please tell someone about it. And what do I mean when I say please tell someone about it? You have a blog, post it on your blog, put it on your website, your Facebook, Twitter, reviews on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. We love reviews on Podcast Addict and other places. We'd love for you, if you have a podcast, to tell other people about this one. Thanks for listening.